Georgia fans, I was wrong and I apologize. You are locked on college football, smothered and covered with your host, Barrett Salee. Your one-stop shop for everything college football. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Today's show brought to you by Game Time. Make your first purchase. They'll give you 20 bucks off. Game Time. First purchase. $20, $20 off. Thank you, Game Time, for being a sponsor of this show. Speaking of this show, it is a Mea Culpa Monday. That, of course, is when I tell you how dumb I am. We got a lot more. We got a lot more. It's firing season. We're going to talk a little bit about all of the firings that took place on Sunday and maybe the challenges that ADs face moving forward. We'll also talk about SEC power rankings. Those went up, and there is a shift in the middle. Not the top. A little bit at the top. But the middle, especially. So we'll do that as well. But first, it is Maya Culpa Monday. What did I get right? What did I get wrong? Well, you know what? We can talk about what I get right, but I'm not braggadocious, right? We're going to talk about what I got wrong, and there, there are a lot of them. There are a lot of them. First things first, Georgia. Let's be honest, the 30 to 15 score doesn't really indicate how much of an absolute beatdown this game was. 23 nothing and a half might as well have been 40 to nothing. Not going to lie. I was stunned, and I think you should be stunned too. Because really, Georgia had not put together a complete game. They were flawed. Carson Beck had been a mess lately. He was a mess in this game, actually. They haven't really run the football all that much. They hadn't really tried. And yet they came out and absolutely dominated a good Texas offensive line, a really, really good Texas offensive line. We can sit here and talk about Texas not ready for the SEC. No, they are ready for the SEC. Georgia just showed Texas how good you have to be, how deep you have to be to win at a high level. So Georgia, I was wrong. I didn't think you had that in you. We all knew that and we still know that the Georgia defensive line is talented. Jalen Walker, my dude, holy moly. But I did not see that coming in the way that we saw. And what I mean by that is a lot of the problems that Georgia had faced and has faced this year, they were still kind of present in that game, which, was, which made it really odd because Carson Beck did not have a great game at all. That's three straight games where he's kind of turned into a pick machine. Yes, Trevor Etienne got a little bit more run, but not a lot. They still tried to throw Carson Beck out of his funk. Not as much as in previous games, like the Alabama game, but they still did that. And so all of the criticism of Georgia, I think, is still valid, at least on the offensive side of the ball. Georgia fans didn't like Mike Bobo before. They probably still don't, but it didn't matter. Because in a matchup that was strength on strength, Georgia's defensive front versus Texas offensive line, it was no contest. It was no contest. So I was wrong. I was 100% wrong about Georgia. I said it would be a 31-21 game. I did not see this one coming because Texas did not have flaws, or at least we hadn't seen flaws from the Texas Longhorns. We've seen flaws from Georgia pretty much all year, or at least outside of the Clemson game. So it was a shift. It was a shift in, in SEC power. It was a shift in the perception of Texas. Is it a shift in the perception of Georgia? Yeah, a little bit on the surface. But we still need to see Mike Bobo focus more on the run. We still need to see that help Carson Beck get out of his funk instead of Carson Beck being asked to throw himself out of his funk. And that's the biggest thing to me, right, with Georgia. 
they've had a really hard time replacing Brock Bowers and Ladd McConkey. I think that hasn't really th that the realization hasn't really hit the coaching staff yet because they really want Arian Smith to be the dude. Georgia really wants Arian Smith to be the guy that Ladd McConkey was. But he's like Featherstone in Necessary Roughness. Don't throw it to Stone Hands. It's exactly what Aaron Smith is. And it's like, okay, you got Love It. You got some other dudes around there. Why not try something different? And it just feels like they're having a hard time finding that guy. And I think that's what's led to a lot of Carson Beck's struggles. And he is struggling, even in that win over Georgia. But the defensive front owning Texas's offensive line, I mean, I don't know what Kirby said to those dudes. We've seen and heard Kirby's pregame speeches, halftime speeches, where there are more F-bombs than actual words. I would have loved to have been in that locker room before that game. Hopefully a recording comes out. I'm just saying, that would be awesome. Next up on Maya Culpa Monday, who's your daddy? I picked Nebraska plus six and a half against Indiana. I was wrong. Good Lord, I was wrong. I, I was wrong in this game. I thought Nebraska would make it close. Full disclosure, I did pick Indiana to win the game. But I thought it would be close. I of of all the teams in the country, is there a better coached team than Indiana? Everything they do is perfect. Everything they do is fundamentally sound. Every offensive play they call is perfect. They're three steps ahead of every opponent they play. It's really remarkable. Kurt Signetti is going to get money thrown at him from every school with an opening or every school that might have an opening. Because that dude has that program at a level that it hasn't been in maybe ever. I was wrong about Indiana within the confines of the Nebraska game because I did think Nebraska would keep it close. I did not expect that kind of blowout at all. So good job, Indiana. Good job, Kurt Signetti, that staff. Uh, you proved me wrong. And you deserve a ton of credit for what you've done. Now, with Curtis Rourke out indefinitely, I'm interested to see what happens. Game day is going to be there against Washington. You're going to have all of this hype, but you have a backup quarterback. Now, Taven's good. was fine in relief of Curtis Rourke against Nebraska, but the game was out of reach at that point, pretty much. Let me pressure on him against a defending national runner-up. That looks way different than it did before, but still. We'll be fascinated to see what happens with, even though it's not necessarily a tough opponent, the biggest game in multiple generations for the Indiana Hoosiers. We'll take a break. When we come back, SEC Power Rankings. It's college football smothered and covered. Of course, we are powered by Locked On. Today's show brought to you by Z-Biotics. Z-Biotics pre-alcohol probiotic drink is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink alcohol, it gets, it gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Pre-alcohol produces an enzyme to break down this byproduct. Just remember to make Z-Biotics your first drink of the night. Drink responsibly, and you'll feel your best tomorrow. Now, you can make it your first of the night, but if you've got that 11 a.m. Central Time start, 12 noon, you might want to have it for breakfast, just saying, because sometimes those game days, which is what I call them, uh, when I was in college, game days, Jack and Coke, they sneak up on you. 
especially in the morning. So you need to have z no matter what time you start the celebration, start that celebration with z -Biotics. Go to zbiotics.com slash locked on college. That's Z biotics.com slash locked on college to learn more and get 15% off your first order when you use locked on college at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason whatsoever, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash locked on college. Use the promo code locked on college at checkout and you'll get 15% Okay, it's time for SEC Power Rankings. If you're listening, appreciate you listening. If you're watching on YouTube, Rumble, we're going to put this up there so you can see it. We're going to run it down really quickly. Georgia, Texas, LSU, the top three. Tennessee, Texas A&M, Ole Miss, Coming in at number six, Vandy at number seven. At number eight, you find the Alabama Crimson Tide. South Carolina at nine, Florida, Arkansas, Missouri, Kentucky, Mississippi State, Oklahoma at 15. And bringing up the rear, my alma mater, a team that everybody in my house loves. And when they suck, it's miserable around here, the Auburn Tigers. 16. That's where Hugh Freeze has them. One spot behind Brent Venables. We'll talk about that coming up next segment. But let's talk a little bit about these rankings. Georgia, number one. Texas, number two. LSU, number three. Not a really surprise there. Tennessee, Texas A&M, Ole Miss. I don't think there's a surprise there. Vandy at number seven. Hello, Clark Lee. He's got Vanderbilt number seven in the power rankings, number 25 in the actual rankings, which still don't matter, but still. What an unbelievable season for Vanderbilt. Look, I know my power rankings don't matter. But I would love to hear from a panel of AP voters. You know how they do, like, we're, we're in election season where they have, you know, a panel of you know, six or nine or 12 people watching a debate and the little lines go up and down based on who likes what or whatever. I would love to hear from AP voters why... It makes any sense whatsoever that you have Alabama 15 and Vandy 25. Vandy beat Alabama. Now, I know head-to-head's not everything, but what has Alabama done to prove that it was a one-off, that loss to Vandy? Nothing. They've played one complete game, and that is Wisconsin. They played a very good half against Georgia. I'd say it was a bad second half. But did you ever think in a, in a year like this, with all of the talent on that Alabama roster, that there would be a situation where they're eighth? Doesn't matter who they're behind. Doesn't matter that it's Vanderbilt. Doesn't matter if it's anybody. Did you ever think that they would be eighth in the SEC in power rankings, anybody's power rankings? And yet I'm looking at these. And if you're watching or if you're listening, Please comment. Please comment. How this is realistic that they would be like, be where they are. Give me a reason why they're behind any of these teams. Georgia, Texas, LSU, Tennessee, Texas A&M, Ole Miss, and Vanderbilt. Is there any reason whatsoever to put Alabama above any of those teams? The answer is no. That is how far this program has fallen under Kalen DeBoer. They've lost to a uh, traditional cellar dweller in Vandy. Embarrassing. Now we know it's not a bad loss because Tom Luganbill and I talk about this on Sirius XM all the time. It's not a bad loss, but still it should never happen. And then you lose to a rival in Tennessee where you look horrendous. Where else can you put Alabama? They have to be eighth or worse in the SEC power rankings. And like I said, for my SEC power rankings, they are number eight. And they are behind Georgia, Texas, LSU, Tennessee, Texas A&M, Ole Miss, and Vanderbilt. Give me a reason why that shouldn't be the case. Give me a reason why that shouldn't be the case. I will gladly hear any and all arguments. I really will. Beyond them, 
South Carolina, Florida, Arkansas, Missouri, Kentucky, Mississippi State, Oklahoma, and Auburn. Okay. 15 and 16. Obviously, the head-to-head -head matters here. Two things on those the, the discussion there. The head-to-head -head matters more than anything else. Auburn still has more upside because they do get to a point where they can capitalize. They get to a point where, you know what? They're pretty good. They can't close teams out. That's why they lost to Oklahoma. They couldn't close Oklahoma out. They can't close anybody out. There is absolutely no reason why they should have lost to Missouri. Auburn over the last 20 years, 105-2 and two in games in which they lead by two or more touchdowns in the fourth, in the second half. One of those, the most recent, was Saturday. But I still think the upside for Auburn is higher than Oklahoma. I don't know what that was for Oklahoma, but the fact here's the thing. I, and I'm this is why Seth Luttrell got fired. We thought Jackson Arnold would be good. They thought Jackson Arnold would be good. And they were way wrong. Now, you can't prepare for having your top five receivers injured. That's just reality. But the scheme wasn't there. The development on the offensive line wasn't there. That is a horrible football team. And their defense has given out. Like, I, their defense is great. But if you suck offensively as much as they suck, you're going to go in a townward trajectory like that. And it's exactly what's happened. Seth Luttrell is a scapegoat. And we're going to talk a little bit about what the dismissal means in the next segment. But it's not just him. It's the whole picture. It's been bad from moment one. But they're still above Auburn because Auburn's a disaster. Full-on disaster. We'll take a break. When we come back, we will talk about those firings and things that maybe you're not thinking about during firing season. Hey, remember, you can join the subtext group. Just go to the link below. You will see how to join, and I will give you insight of things that I'm thinking. Talked about a little bit of the firing stuff uh, today in the text that I sent to all the subscribers. And, you know, I think when, when all is said and done, it is basically a light version of an article directly to you and you can text me back and tell me how stupid I am or how brilliant I am. And you can also send questions for Q&A in that subtext group. When we come back, we'll talk a bit about firing season. It's college football is smothered and covered and of course we are powered by Locked On. Today's show brought to you by Game Time. You know Game Time. You love Game Time. Probably the best, not probably, it is the best ticket option out there. I don't think there's one any better. They've got Game Time picks. Curation makes it easier to save more on sports, concerts, comedy, and theater. They got it all in pricing. Toggling this feature shows the total up front with no surprise fees at checkout. Let's be honest. When you buy through other ticket sites, you can say, hey, you know what? I got a $10 ticket, standing room only ticket to a baseball game. Oh, no, that's $40 after fees. Game time doesn't have that. You can see the all-in pricing right there on the app. Seat views give you a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy it. They have a lowest price guarantee as well. Or game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Ticket coverage or purchased is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time Picks. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use Locked On College. That is Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On College, L O C K E D O N C O L L E G. <laughs> for $20 off. Download game time today. What time is it? It is game time. Fire and season, fire and season. The fire and squad is out. Mike Houston out at ECU. Hall out at Southern Miss. Seth Luttrell out at Oklahoma. Let's first talk about Oklahoma. When you're jettisoning in, 
Yes. <laughs> wow. When you start to jettison coordinators mid-season, especially when all of the issues are apparent, that really some of which don't have to, anything to do with the offensive coordinator. No wide receivers. Offensive line that's inexperienced. And quarterback situations that are a problem. Which of those were actually in control of Seth Luttrell? Quarterback development, offensive line. When you don't have five wide receivers, it's a problem. So some of the issues that exist on the offense at Oklahoma had nothing to do with Seth Luttrell, mainly five injured wide receivers. Now, yes, the offensive line hasn't been developed, and yes, Jackson Arnold uh, was a disaster at the beginning of the season. But the bigger point is that when you begin to jettison coordinators midseason, there actually is pressure on you. And pressure to keep your job. Now, the buyout is over 40. We know that. You're going to get, what, $60, $65 million a year in the SEC moving forward. There's a lot of oil money in Oklahoma. You can pass the hat to at least do enough to make it financially responsible to get rid of Brent Venables. And he knows that. That's why Seth Luttrell was dismissed on Sunday. It wasn't all his fault. The offensive problems, they go beyond him, including simply with Lady Luck. But Brent Venables feels the pressure. He understands that, yes, his job is on the line, maybe not like Billy Napier's before the season or you know anybody else's, but you do not begin to jettison coordinators mid-season if you don't feel legitimate pressure no matter where it's coming from not saying brent venables is going to get fired but what i am saying is that clearly it is a possibility not a probability but a possibility now with all of these dismissals that took place on Sunday, I want you to think of this. In the new age, we've seen in the new age, we've seen in the new age of college football and decisions that ADs are forced to make, that they do make them earlier. The transfer portal opening up in December, early signing period, bowl prep, all of that stuff. Decisions need to be made sooner. The 12-team playoff has drastically changed the mindset of athletic directors. Talk to a lot of them. And a lot of them have no idea how to deal with some of this stuff. Because, yes, coaches get dismissed earlier now than they ever have. But what if you're trying to hire a head coach in the 12-team playoff? What if you're trying to hire an assistant coach in the 12-team playoff, or any of them that are even coaching in November that might have a chance of making the 12-team playoff. What do you do? What do you do? Do you hold back? Do you fire later? Do you fire earlier? Do you run the risk of whoever your targets are having more suitors later and not getting who you want? I don't know. And they don't know. That's the biggest thing is that they don't know. And there's no good answer. There's no good way to do this. And it goes back to something that I've talked about forever. I've talked to coaches about this. The calendar is awful. It's awful for coaches, it's awful for players, it's awful for ADs, it's awful for everybody. So we saw two head coaches dismissed. Obviously, we saw 
Seth Luttrell dismissed as Oklahoma's offensive coordinator. I'm fascinated to see what happens with ECU and Southern Miss because one would think that they might be interested in assistants that are coaching in the 12 team playoff or some that are at least in that discussion in November with teams that are pretty good. Do Mac schools follow suit next week? Do Conference USA schools? Stand back to low-level Power 5 schools. Start making decisions quicker, knowing that, hey, offensive coordinator X for uh, an SEC team that's sort of on the fringe might get looks from better schools. I don't know the answer, and they don't either. So it's fascinating to see what might happen in this world because firing season has changed dramatically. And there's no blueprint for how to handle it moving forward. I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the trash. <laughs> the trash incident at Texas was disgraceful. It was poorly handled. Everything about it was awful and yet we ended up with the right right scenario at the end they got the call right the referee the the official who made the bad call took accountability within the confines of that meeting saying that he got it wrong and yet they probably looked at the jumbotron they felt the pressure all of that stuff there's not a person on the planet that during a situation where fans are so upset with you that they're throwing trash on the field, wouldn't look inward and say, did I get this wrong? And then even if it's out of the corner of their eye, look at the Jumbotron and see how poorly they missed a call. There's not a person on the planet who wouldn't out of the corner of his eye look up at that jumbotron and think, wow, that's awful. They'll never admit it. But that sets a terrible precedent because now we'll see, guarantee you we'll see more trash thrown on the field because ultimately that got the call changed. Even if it wasn't a factor, it gave the officials time to discuss it. They wouldn't have had that time otherwise. It sets a terrible precedent. And yet the call was right at the end. They got it all right. But can you imagine what would happen if that determined or even just had a big impact on the result of that game? Kirby Smart, Smart might have killed somebody. He might have killed somebody. But again, the call... The outcome was right. The circuitous route it took to become right was disgraceful. Disgraceful. Clearly, it wasn't pass interference. I'm not sure how that flag was thrown to begin with. Clearly, Texas fans should not have thrown trash on the field. Clearly, the officials shouldn't have used that extra time to suddenly change their mind. And we know that they saw the replay on the Jumbotron. There's not a person in America that wouldn't peek up there and say, ooh, that was bad. We should probably change that. And then how on earth does Texas not get penalized for unsportsmanlike conduct with their, their team, their fans throwing things on the field? I don't know. But they got it right. Somehow, they got it right. Reminder, join the subtext group. Description below if you're listening or if you're watching. Description below. You can text me directly, even if you hate me. Thank you for making this your first listen. For your second listen, go listen to Locked On College Football. Spencer McLaughlin does a great job over there. Until tomorrow, have a great Monday, everybody. We will talk to you on Tuesday.